Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Deep. He's Kiran. And uh, today we are talking about uh, OpenStack, tapping into the OpenStack notification system. Um, so we can talk about OpenStack and notifications and our experiences dealing with it, wrestling with it. Um, we've also written some specific code to, you know, and open sourced it, and Kiran is going to go into the details of that. And then we will run through some demos of things that we have done and are working on. So this is, think of it as a work in progress. Okay, now let's see if this works. Ah, okay. <laughs> so as I said, the agenda, we just introduce notifications, then how we hook into the notification system, the use cases, and then we kind of go through a live demo. And a shout out to actually two of our team members who contributed a lot to the notification system that we've kind of built at ZeroStack. They could not come here for personal reasons. I was there, they'd have been here. Okay, so first off, you know, this is maybe obvious to a lot of you, but just wanted to go through the very, very basics as to why do we kind of need a notification system. So obviously, to monitor and troubleshoot a private cloud, or for that matter, any management system, you kind of, you need a notification system. Uh, to measure consumption, you know, when as things change in your in the cloud, you want to be able to kind of capture those moments and kind of string it together to measure consumption of the system, right? Uh, to measure performance, right? Um, to discover, you know, security compliance violations. You know, a VM comes up and certain ports are open and certain ports are closed. Somebody uploads an image. Is that image a good one or a bad one? You know, to kind of, you can use notifications as the basis for, as a starting point for some of those things. Uh, the other one, uh, which be a, ni a nice thing that you know notifications can be used for, is a call-out mechanism. That you know, you something gets notified, and then an external process or an application does some some other work, and then when it's done, then the the private cloud goes on to the next step. You know, a nice call-out mechanism. That's another very useful use case for a notification system. So this is a kind of a, a picture of a poor man's view of you know, OpenStack services kind of stacked together. You have a set of stateless services on the right side, you know, and Keystone is a common one, and you have these other dedicated services for Nova, Neutron, Cinder, everything, and then you have MySQL as the you know, as the, as, as the state saving system. And then on the left, you see the AMQP massive messaging system. You could be using RabbitMQ or um, what's the other one? I forget. Uh, 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 Cupid, 00MQ, Cupid, right, but the underlying AMQP messaging system. And then the Oslo is a common set of libraries that have been written so that, you know, there is much better code reuse within, uh, within OpenStack. So specifically with respect to notification, you know, it's the AMQP messaging system, and within Oslo, the Oslo.messaging layer that kind of plays a role in kind of dealing with all of the notification, the, the publish, subscribe, the RPCs, and things like that, right? Oh, sorry. So the Oslo messaging API is used for RPCs and notifications over the underlying transport, whether that be RabbitMQ or Cupid or 0MQ, right? And the AMQP service, that's the middleware that enables OpenStack services that kind of you know, run on multiple servers to be able to talk to one another, to communicate. So you know, it supports uh, three implementations today, RabbitMQ, Cupid, 0MQ. So in terms of the messaging workflow, let's kind of start with a very simple example of you know, creating a VM, right? So a Nova VM create request, whether you make an API call or you make a CLI call request, it goes to the Nova API service layer. And uh, from there, you know, a, a, a request kind of is queued into the MQP service that there's a VM create request. Uh, the, the Nova scheduler is listening for, you know, on that queue for VM create requests. And once you know, it listens and then it decides where to schedule this, on which host to schedule this, and then that places a request that, you know, launch this VM on this host. And then the Nova compute where the actual VM is going to live, that is listening in for requests about Oh, somebody is asking me to launch a VM on my host, and it's going to take, whenever it gets a request, it will go launch a VM, right? Now, in all of these, there are notifications that are also 
coming into the system. So whenever the Nova scheduler is making a decision about placement of VMs, you know, it sets a beginning notification scheduler dot select underscore destinations dot start. And then when that decision has been made, there is another you know, notification that is sent out scheduler underscore dot select underscore destinations dot end. Uh, when the compute instance is about to be created, you get a compute.instance.create.start notification. When the compute instance has completion has has been created, then you get a compute.instance.create.end notification. And we kind of see some of these in action, you know, in a, in a demo down down the line. So now I'll pass it on to Kiran. He'll talk about some of the you know the, the code and things that we've written. Kiran. Oh, one thing we uh, did was actually we open source a library which uh, walks through some of the examples that you see here. And also most of our uh, zero stack whole system itself is written in Golang, uh, not Python. Uh, there's uh, some basic reasons for it, like most of this, if you've looked at Golang before, there are uh, pretty common reasons. It's great for writing services, network services, web services, uh, message processing services. Concurrency and communication is really part of the language. Uh, you get uh, multi-threading for free, almost free. <laughs> and it lets us scale to build uh, really large systems where we're processing a lot of notifications. And a lot of the built-in libraries help in parsing some of these notification data and how you unmarshal them, look at them, and then put them back as you need into the rest of the system. And one of the biggest advantages that we found with Go is Almost everyone who's uh, joined Zero Stack came from very different diverse background. Java, Python, C, C++, and all of these people took on to Golang, you know, like fish takes to water. So it really was uh, the language of choice for us to build whatever systems we are building. Given that, uh, I want to dive a little deeper into the library that we've open sourced, like, you know, walk through some of the code examples here on screen and, you know, show you how to build a system yourself using either the library that we have or on your own in any different language. And to basically hook it to notifications, one thing to remember first is that notifications is a subset of the things that the messaging system is used for in OpenStack. Uh, the basic workload functionality itself, like our pieces and everything, also run through notification, also run through the messaging system. So you have to be careful that you're looking at the notifications rather than the rest of the messaging system. And I'll talk about one gotchas, you know, a little bit later. So first thing is if you search on the internet for like, you know, enable notifications open stack, you'll find 10 different uh, ways to enable notifications. We'll show you an example of how it actually, the configuration that works for us in Kilo. Then how do you connect to the RabbitMQ uh, system? How do you listen for these notifications? What type of data do you get on the notifications? And how do you parse it and process using that one. So this is the configuration for Nova, Neutron, and Keystone. We'll actually maybe upload a readme.md into our open source library, which the rest of the configuration. This has been, uh, there are various different ways to enable this in different versions. And if you search, you'll see all the way from uh, maybe SX till now and how to enable notifications. This is the one that works in Kilo. Now this is an example of the type of information that you need to be able to talk to the notification system. And the information that you need to provide is the exchange, the exchange type, the queue, the binding key, and the consumer tag. And these are important because when you want to talk to the notification system, you basically give the exchange open stack, the topic, the notifications or info, and the consumer tag is any tag that you want to give. And this is where I was saying you have to watch out for gotchas because if uh, you end up hooking into a wrong uh, exchange or the wrong topic, you end up barking your OpenStack installation because instead of the Nova compute processing some message, you get the message. The VM never gets created. So you're really a bit careful that you are monitoring the notifications and not the main RPC mechanisms because you can you can actually like you know take over the Nova compute agents functionality if you really care. All of this all of this code is on the open source module so you can look at it offline after. So once you have this basic information on how to connect, uh, how do you initialize the client? This is, again, a full Golang example. But basically, you 
connect to the AMQP, you declare the channel that you want to talk to, and then the binding key and the exchange, and then you start consuming the message from it. And the messages actually come out in a Golang channel. We're using an AMQP library here, pretty standard AMQP library in Golang. That's how the flow looks like. All the previous information that you had with respect to exchange, exchange type, queue, binding key, and consumer tag, this is how they're used to basically talk to the queues. Once you, once you have a channel on which you're receiving these messages from AMQP, from RabbitMQ, then this is how you pass them. You basically get uh, on the message channel that you just created. You basically get all these messages. And all these messages have a very standard format. We'll walk through some examples of what those formats look like. And they have a basic format and a payload. And here's a simple example of, you know, we unmarshal the data. And again, this part is in open source. What the OS notification data looks like, we'll go through it. And you handle this, handle this message. So the types of notifications that you get, here's like a small list. If you look at the open source, you know, we've uh, declared you know, constants and passed like a million of these uh, notifications in the library. And you basically get these notifications with a type which is a string. And as an example, like Deep just talked about, there is a compute instance, create start, when the Nova compute has decided that it is going to start creating a VM. And if you're deleting a VM, you get the delete start. And if you're basically on live migrating, as an example, you get instance live migration start. So there's a lot of these events that you uh, look through. So ensure you, instead of you having to pass through this, we've actually collected a lot of the useful ones, and we put it in our open source library. And there's more and more of these from all the different services. There's an exhaustive list that, you know, that you'll find online. So as an example of a compute instance payload, what is the payload of this message that you get in the notification look like? Uh, I apologize if it's too small in the back to see, but we couldn't fit, uh, fit it in a bigger font. So it gives you a lot of information about what the compute instance payload is. Uh, so you get the UID, you get the name, you get like details about when it was launched, created, uh, what type of instance it is, the image metadata, what image is being used to, used to create the VM. Uh, you get state, what state it is in right now. And one of the in interesting things is when you, the VM is going through uh, power state changes, you can also enable notifications for that. Uh, I don't think I have an example for that in the online, but we'll add that to the open source library. And you get the rest of the information about the image with respect to how many vCPUs and memory it's configured to start with. Now, when you have this, well, this looks pretty rich. And Nova is actually a, sending a lot of this information in the payload. And one of the things also that Nova sends is uh, it gives you some token outside of the compute instance payload, which you can use to actually query for more information back from OpenStack back from the rest of the services. So if you look at volume notification, similarly, uh, you have a lot of rich payload information there, which tells you what is the ID, what is the type, what is the display name, when it was launched, what availability zone uh, it was created in, the status. And you get multiple notifications for some of, not just for these, but for some of these uh, entities you get multiple notifications based on when they were started, when they were processed, and when the state changes. So there's a lot of different ways to enable what type of notifications we want. We'll walk through some of those, even if you look in the open source code. So a networking example, which uh, we'll actually go through a live demo of part of this one, is you create a network, you get a information about what is the network type, whether it's shared or not, and the segmentation ID for that network. Same thing with respect to uh, keystone, and there's an intentional uh, choice of uh, the order of these things that we've shown. As you can see, no is the richest one. Keystone starts becoming lesser and lesser. And as a simple example here, the payload just has a project ID when you create a pro uh, project. It doesn't even have the name. So this is something that we'll talk about, some of the gotchas in this notification system that we miss. So same thing with uh, images. So if you look at it, uh, the example that we've shown, 
talk about all the different types of entities that you have in the system and all the information about the different notifications that you get. We've collected all of these payload and we've written the Golang descriptions for these and you know open source and put it in the library. But you could go back to the source and some of these we had to go back to the source as opposed to just observing the events to see what gets generated. And uh, part of the code is you know you can redo the same thing in Python. They redo the same thing in some other language. There's nothing which prevents it. So we'll people talk more about now using this open source uh, library that we put together, how you, once you configure it, once you hook into it, and you can start passing these notifications. The library that we have actually uh, open source doesn't actually do any work in each of, the, like each of the actions, finally, after you get the event. We'll show an example of some things that we do, but the basic, the bare bones library that we put out is more for you to figure out what sort of you know auditing, security, and all these other things you want to do. We'll show a few examples here, but that's just a starting point. Thanks, Ben. So um, we'll, let's see. We'll just go through. The... So we'll look at a, a few examples. So, so one of them is, you know, when you create a VM, and that's great if the VM is connected to the private network. Then you decide to give the VM a floating IP, and all of a sudden, that VM gets accessible to everybody in your corporate intranet. And at that point, the security compliance, all kind of red flags go up in their head, and they probably want to run some kind of test to make sure that you don't have the wrong ports open and things like that. And that's something we could leverage the notification system to do some work there. So let's uh, kind of go through a demo. I'll pray to the demo gods that things work. Mm -hmm. Right. So today we'll uh, use the, the, the zero stack, uh, the UI. It's essentially you know, a replacement for Horizon. Um, OK. And uh, I have a bad build. So throughout the whole demo, you'll see internal server error. Please disregard it. Mm -hmm. So the product person doesn't stay up to date with the latest code base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, so on here I have a kind of a log where you'll see some of the notifications. So it's as crude as it can get, right? This is the logs. You'll see the messages, and we'll do some things there. And then. So we wanted to highlight the fact that the same library that we've actually open sourced, that is the exact library we actually use in house to actually pass these notifications. Like I said, we've put the skeleton out. What we do in each of the, when we receive each of the notifications, is some code that we demo here. So the log messages that you'll see is what you'll actually see from the open source library. Yeah. So uh, we're creating a new VM. It's a Cirrus VM, so it should get created very quickly. Um, so volume, let's give it a network. We don't want to assign a floating IP. Let's give it you know, all the security groups. Big. There's no cloud in it. Um, so, so I'll create the VM. Let us see on the other side what's happening. This is what uh, ah. the Intel SUSE was saying. Like we want to create VMs in two seconds, so the demos, all the demos get faster. I think the the volume creation is happening, and then the VM creation will start. It's like the demo gods have not heard my it's prayers. A, it's going to take a little bit of time. Oh, I think it's filling up a lot. So. It's another window. The same notification. You'll see that. Yeah. Ah, OK. There's other notifications. So see the this is all the JSON uh, <laughs> body of all the notifications that we have received. And uh, like deep showed like four notifications that happen as part of the VM create. There's a few more, actually. You will see them in the log. For example, there's a port create start, port create end. Yeah. There's a bunch of other notifications. Just for brevity, we showed like we talked about only four. There's a longer list of notifications that happen with each sequence of VM creation, network creation yeah. that so, we'll see in the log. So you can see the the you know the scheduler dot select dot destinations dot start. 
that's the notification that's been sent by the Nova, uh, you know, the, 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 the host where this VM is supposed to be created. Then you have the you know, scheduler.select.destinations.end, and then you know, the compute, when the actual compute create instance starts, you see that the compute.instance.create.start, and then when the compute create instance has completed, you should be able to see that if I, if I can pick it up with my mm -hmm. device. Yeah, there you go. So they did show up in that order in which we described it. Now, let's go back to the VM. So this VM has only an internal IP. I, let me just try to separate it out a little bit. Yeah. Let me give it a, a floating IP. This is where once, uh, till now this VM is internal, once you give it a floating IP, it's actually accessible from outside. And that's when, you know, like Deep was saying, red flags go up, some antennas go, you know, starts perking up saying, okay, now that this VM is accessible over the network, then you really start worrying about what to do. This is one way where it doesn't matter which user has created a VM in your cloud, as opposed to the user having to initiate something the system can automatically look for notifications, and based on those notifications, try to do more uh, vulnerability assessment, yeah. as opposed to every user having to schedule something manually. Right, and so here we got the floating IP of 172.161. Uh, this is where the, it should be the other one here. So one thing also to remember with respect to the notifications is uh, it does take some time for the VM to get created, for the floating IP to be assigned, and the network to come up. So one thing we realized is if we just uh, try to scan the VM right away, as soon as you get a notification, the VM actually is not up. The network is not up. We have to wait for some number of right. seconds before we can really start scanning it. So, so in this one example, uh, yeah. what we did really was on getting the VM uh, floating IP assignment notification, which is the floating IP uh, create end, we went and actually ran uh, a port scanner on it. And the port scanner actually shows what ports are uh, open and closed on this VM. So similarly, we have more uh, network scanning tools that we use whenever the VM comes up and collect this report and show it in the UI. That is a basic way to drive some of these uh, views that we sh that ha enabled in the zero stack environment with respect to the admin being able to view what's going on with the different uh, VM creations and projects in one place, as opposed to, like I said, again, each user having to manually and verify it. This gives a better vulnerability assessment in a central place for the whole cloud. Right. So we'll go back to the... Can we do all the questions after this? I think this will finish very quickly and then happy to take your questions. Um, so while doing this, just one thing to mention out here was that this is the, the, the data that is used is the notification that we are listing on provides the actual the IP address of the VM that it got and then we kind of use that to uh, you know, do the, the scanning and all of that stuff. So the next thing that where we leverage the, the notification system is you know, project approvals. Um, everybody wants to create a project and create their VMs, but as a cloud admin, you want to kind of keep some tabs on it, some control over it. And so when a project is created, there's a project create notification that gets, you know, get, gets generated and that gives some details of the project uh, until a cloud admin you know, approves that project, we, we hide it. And the notification is used to kind of send some information to the cloud admin and for him to make a decision whether he wants to approve or reject you know, the creation of that project. And until he approves, that project is not visible in the system. So that's another place where we kind of use the notification system. Uh, a third one is in, you know, this is still a work in progress for us. Uh, so kind of verifying uploaded images, uh, project members, project admins, business unit, you know, application teams, they can upload their own images. 
Um, oftentimes, these images may not be the best images around where they found it. So, you know, a, a, as a corporate policy, you might want to figure out whether these images are blessed or they have, they don't have viruses and things like that. So, you can, kind of, you know, our system listens for image upload notifications based on that. You know, it, it kind of kickstarts a verification process. You know, Linux images can be scanned with something like Open SCAP. Windows images can be scanned using LibNTFS, and the, you know, Symantec has its tools for scanning, say, VMDK images on Windows machines and things like that, so various tools that are out there that can be leveraged, right? Well, the basic idea is that the framework that you can use to do all this is the offline notification mechanisms that you're getting from OpenStack, and you can build uh, your own workflows on top of it, both for security, for compliance, and other things. Right. So last but not the least is, um, one of the things we, we, we use quite a bit in, in, in ZeroStack is leverage the notification system to create a timeline view of the world. Whether a, whenever a new VM is created or a new project is created, right from its birth till as long as it's alive, you know, what's been happening to it. So from a compliance or you know, purpose or from an auditing compliance purpose or for troubleshooting purposes, that comes in very handy. Uh, so I'll just kind of Run, show you some some examples of what we do. So, for instance, out here you see that you know this VM got created, and these are kind of stored in the timeline view. Over time, as this VM ages, there's a lot more data that shows up out here, and we kind of merge this with you know VM metrics. So I could go ahead and select you know n number of metrics of that VM, and the system would kind of show all the graphs. There's only data on the right edge, if you see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because there's VM no graph on it yet. This VM just got created, right? <laughs> and over time, the VM will have a lot of red dots. Something may have gone wrong with the VM and things like that. So you could potentially kind of select a particular red event, and it would go all the way down through all the metrics. So, so you know, a very useful scenario is you know, somebody files a bug saying his VM is not behaving and a cloud admin or whoever is troubleshooting can kind of go back in time and see what might have happened to that VM in the past. Right? So these are some things that and This is something that we really uh, felt a lot of need for because customers say, oh, my uh, user says last night uh, his VM had performance issues. How do you troubleshoot that? Right. But we, we basically built the zero stack system to really collect a lot of information, both with respect to events, like from notifications and other events and also time series data sort of overlay all this information and show it to users. Yeah. And that's one of the benefits of kind of running part of the zero stack system as a SaaS thing platform in the cloud that we're able to kind of run the big data analytics and all of that and, and show some of these things. And here at a project level, you can see across multiple VMs, everything that was ever done to that project, you see it here, right? You see a timeline view uh, and you can go back and kind of you know, move this back and forth and kind of go and, and do some of these things. So that comes in very handy for, for our customers, right? Right. So, uh, and I think let's move to the last. So, Kiran, you want to talk about the issues with? Yeah, I mean, one thing is we said, hey, you know, it's so great we can hook into all these things and get all this information. But as I was uh, alluding to at the big in the middle, not every notification system has been built with the same level of detail in mind. So, Nova actually comes with them some of the richest amount of information. And it actually gives you a token so you can go back and query for more information if you need it. Uh, Keystone actually, I think, is about the most bare bone one with respect to notification information. For example, like if you saw, I think, in the UI, I don't know if anyone spotted it, it said uh, something got created with, you know, there's no name next to it. So that's one of the reasons, for example, the Keystone project creation doesn't even actually come with a name, just a UUID. Now, if you really want to go back and figure out more information about this event, you actually need authorization credentials, which are you know, difficult to manage in an automated system because different projects have different authorization levels and roles. Uh, this is why using more API calls to fill in this information becomes you know, important. It would, it would be nice if uh, the notification system itself was improved because when we looked at the code, there is information there which gives you the richer information that could be posted in the notification. Uh, we are working on uh, some of that code base also to upstream it, sort of make, to make more information, richer information available. And 
that eliminates some of the back and forth API calls that we had to do to get this information. So this, uh, all the code base that we ran in, and we showed you the live demo, all of this is actually available in the open source library. And like I said, it's more of, here's how you, where you get the notification, what do you do with it is all left in the shell code that you guys go fill in. And as we build more richer information with respect to port scanning or scanning images, we'll uh, open source more of that too. It's just not in a stable state yet. And even if you're not a Go shop, I think, you know, some of the work we've done in creating the structs around the information that flows back and forth can be very handy in, in writing in any other language. Okay. We're open for questions. So I think we're open for questions. Uh, so yeah. please step to the mic, I think. Step to the mic if, uh, yeah, if, yeah. if possible, yeah. It looks great, guys. Um, one of the problems I've seen with notifications is if you are doing some action or some API request that's going across uh, services, how do you link all of the notifications back to a single API request? So that is, that is a very, very good question. How do you link uh, one request that happened, for example, like we said, a VM create request with all these notifications flying around the system, right? So this is where we had to do a lot of the work with respect in the code to track these things over time. So once you get the basic information for, you know, a VM create, the initial request, then we had to go track all of these requests that are happening with respect to the rest of the scheduler and host events and everything. We track it in our system by putting together a temporary in-memory tracking of each of these things. Yes, I mean, that part of it, it's not in the open source library, but like I said, it's really more of what you really want to do with it. If you really want to more, for example, one thing, one basic thing we do is we get the project event, we just store it in the database and we don't actually get any more information. When someone really logs in, we can use that person's credentials to go look up the information about that project from the database and real-time API calls to construct the view and show it. Because then you know that the person has authorization to access the information about that project. I don't know if that answers your question. We have, we have to do a lot of heavy lifting to sort of put sense of all of this together. Yes. Right. I have two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, do you see the notification is lossy? So you do miss some not notifications? I mean, that's based on our experience that uh, uh, depends on the load of the system and you sometimes just kind of mysteriously saying, okay, how come this information is missing? It turned out that the guy is just not sending it. The second one is on the port scan. That's a, that's a great application. Do you have to muck around the security groups so that the the security groups allow you to scan all the ports, otherwise it'd be everything gets dropped except that uh, permitted by the security group. So for the first question, uh, well, do you miss notifications, like are they lossy? There's two things there. First thing is you should attend the RabbitMQ talk. The, uh, you could look at the video of the RabbitMQ talk that was yesterday by the Pivotal guy. Uh, you really have to tune this a lot so that RabbitMQ is, you know, keeps it up and running. And we, what we found is RabbitMQ is a nervous system of OpenStack. You know, lots of bad things happen if RabbitMQ goes bad. <laughs> so part of it also is that once you keep it healthy, we don't miss notifications once it stays healthy. The second thing also is we've, uh, because, because of the RabbitMQ messaging notification system, if you actually have problems in your own code and you crash and come back up, notifications are sitting there waiting for you as long as they're not overflown, like, you know, for a long time. So we basically solve that by looking at, you know, like I said, we try to keep RabbitMQ healthy just because otherwise the rest of the functionality doesn't work. Uh, the second part of it is, yeah, you really have to make sure that in your own processing that you capture it quickly, all read messages as fast as you can, and then do more of the lazy processing offline in a synchronous manner. Because if you try to do synchronously, go back and call the APIs to get more information, we found that that actually backs up, increases the backlog a lot. So doing that asynchronously, which is why you know Go is great because spin off a Go routine for handling every notification works great for us. Uh, the oh, the second question. So the, yes, I think if you if you noticed uh, in the UI, we actually had to enable the basic security group for that VM also, which is what lets you do the port scan. 
This is more of a discussion point than a question, but you talked about the lack of rich notifications being a problem. I would caution you not to look at each event that doesn't have enough information because that is essentially a scalability feature of complex systems. So if, if getting all those little pieces is expensive, then yeah. it decreases your overall scalability. Yes, I mean, it's a valid point. Like, trying to gen collect a lot of information in the system to send it out as a notification is definitely not the right way to do because it might be like, you know, like you said, trying to put together that information is too much, too expensive. What I was more referring to is that we've seen places where I think it is possible to send more information that actually exists in those modules, as opposed to going back and doing API calls itself to get those. Whatever information is available, posting that would help in, because there's, there's a different reason. I, and like I said, you know, actually, we call it, the original title of this presentation was Notifications for Fun and Profit. It's more of really observing everything and for profit also in terms of really what can you do with it. So you're tapping the RabbitMQ bus, the mm -hmm. notification bus. Um, do you guys use Salometer alerts? Because I know that they're also tapped on the same bus, and those messages are taken out of the queue, and so they're not right, available for consumption. How do you deal with that, or do you just turn that off? So we actually do not use Salometer. Uh, we, when we started about this a year and a half ago, it wasn't in a state that we could use in our products, so we have our own lot of internal monitoring and notification mechanism for the rest of the infrastructure the Silometer tries to use. And uh, at the beginning when we tried this, we tried to do the fan out uh, thing in RabbitMQ, which wasn't very stable, so we, we avoided going down that route. Can, can you go into more detail about what the, your experiences with fan out is? Because we're talking about doing the same thing. <laughs> I think I'll let you go on it offline. We tried it about a year ago, and we didn't go too much down that rabbit hole of trying to enable the fan out. We can think up offline about that one. The, but that, I mean, like just as a high level uh, thing. So you could try to do uh, one key thing about, like I said, one gotcha about don't tap into the wrong command channels and notifications and topics, because then you're barking your open stack. The same thing with respect notifications.info. There can be only one reader of this one. One option to enable multiple uh, consumers of this is to enable the fan out feature, where you can, like, you know, multiple consumers can read off this channel. Uh, so, Silometer and our system, like, you know, our, your library, whatever, can also, like, you know, uh, try to get the same message. We avoided going that route, and only our code reads it. We don't enable Silometer in your, in our system. If you enable Silometer, I think we'll have to talk more about, you know, the fan out part of it. But one thing, uh, if you just at a high level, if you look at the zero stack, like this little bit of UI we showed, is we realized that a lot of the information that we wanted to collect didn't exist in terms of, we collect a lot more real-time information of what's going on in the cloud, which Silometer wasn't. Silometer was heavily notification-based, as opposed to a lot of uh, statistics and meta information that we collect. So we use some of these notifications overlaid with the rest of the information we collect. So for that, we basically like, wrote a lot of the notification capture and processing on our own. Yeah. There's no more questions, then thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for coming, yeah. I really appreciate it.